Take your Bibles with me this morning. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to primarily be in verse 11 this morning. As Paul talks about four offices within the church. He says in verse 11, And he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. These are four offices in the church that Paul describes given by God. Now, first I want us to understand that you can do the work of an office without holding an office. Let me illustrate that. I was in sales for a number of years, and oftentimes I would do the work of an engineer. I would work with engineers, and they would need to develop a process, and so I would help them engineer the process, and I would do, in essence, engineering. But I can tell you, I don't have the schooling of an engineer, I don't have the degree of an engineer, I don't have the title of an engineer, but yet I was doing the work of an engineer. Does that make sense? You can do the work, for example, of a pastor without being a pastor. You can shepherd someone, which is what pastoring really is, without holding the office of pastor. I think that's an important distinction to make as we work through this verse. And also, I I thought, you know, an illustration that might help us understand what Paul is driving at. And I thought of me building my house a couple of years ago. Well, it's been more than a couple now, almost 10. Um, But I built my own home. And uh, after we got the site prepped, we had the excavators come in and, and clear the stumps and dig the hole. And guess who was next on the site? It was the foundation layer, the mason. And he came in and he formed up footings and he poured the footings, and then he built block on the footings, and he laid the foundation, okay? And then I came along, and I built, and guess what I built upon? The foundation, that's correct, that's correct. And as we work through this, I'm going to demonstrate for you that Paul here in verse 11, he's talking about the apostles and the prophets, and they are foundation layers, and then he talks about the evangelists and the shepherds and teachers. And by the way, you, say, you might say, you said four. There seems like there's five. Well, shepherd teachers is one office. And these are the builders. They come in and build on that foundation. And so I'll probably refer back to the illustration as we get a little further into the text this morning. But let's start with talking about the first office, the apostles. And he gave the apostles. We spent some time way back in January, probably some of you weren't even a part of our church yet, (laughs) back in January, when we talked about Paul being an apostle when we began Ephesians 1, chapter 1, as Paul introduced himself as the apostle of Jesus Christ. What is an apostle? Well, these are representatives sent directly by Jesus Christ who could testify of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They witnessed his resurrected body. And, and originally, it was the 12. Of course, it was the 11 for a little while, right? Because Judas hung himself. And so they replaced Judas in Acts chapter 2 with Matthias. And uh, they cast lots. And Matthias had also witnessed the resurrected Christ. He was with them in the ministry. He just was not one of the 12. We need to understand that it wasn't just... Thirteen men, Jesus and his twelve, traveling around. There were often others who would join in together. The twelve were the inner circle. They are the apostles, the disciples and the apostles after Jesus resurrected. And Matthias was chosen to replace Judas Iscariot after Judas had hung himself. And then we have Paul being called to be an apostle as he's on the road to Damascus. Remember, and he sees a bright light and he's blinded and this voice calls out and he's told he's going to be the apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Now we have others who are called an apostle throughout the book of Acts. Barnabas is called an apostle. There are others. But I really believe that the office of apostle is held by those 12 as well as Paul. But the others were doing the work of an apostle. What does that mean? What does it mean to do the work of an apostle? Well, an apostle would be an ambassador. In Greek language, that would have been the idea. Someone who represented a king or an emperor who was sent on a mission. And they had the authority to speak for the one who sent them. That's what an ambassador would do, right? They can go to another country and they can speak on behalf of the President of the United States to say, this is what... We have to tell you. That's what the apostles were. 
But the specific office of apostle required them to have seen and be able to testify personally of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, is there anyone in this audience this morning who can do that today, that you have seen the resurrected Christ? No. Guess what that means? There are no apostles among us today. They, they, are, they are done. And we'll make the case that Scripture teaches that very clearly, even in our, the book of Ephesians as we move along. But there are people who still speak on behalf of Christ in some sense, right? We'll get there. I'll talk more about that when we get to another office that we're going to talk about this morning. The apostles were given to, to raise up the church, to share the gospel with the resurrected Christ and the gospel with the world, to raise up the church, to begin the church. They would go into a community, they preach the gospel, and we see that in Paul's life as he went to Gentiles, very clear, clearly laid out in Acts, but there were others who were scattered, especially through persecution, and the apostles were the first builders of the church, weren't they? They also are the writers of Scripture. You know, Peter, an apostle. Paul, an apostle. These are those who wrote Scripture for us that we have today. So God gave the apostles, and God also gave the prophets. Now, this one's a little more mysterious, I guess I should say. I, the Scripture doesn't talk a lot about the prophets, but I had... Uh, Jimmy, read this morning 1 Corinthians chapter 14 because it talks a lot about prophesying there. And let's turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, in the book of Acts, we do see a man named Agabus described as a prophet. Agabus would, could predict the future at different points. So there was some type of sign, miraculous sign, that he was able to do as a prophet. He predicted that Paul, if he went back to Jerusalem, was going to be bound and turned over to the Gentiles. Did that happen? Yes, it did. So Agabus had a special gift from God as a prophet to be able to predict what was going to happen by the Spirit. I mean, he didn't know everything that was going to happen, but specific events, the Holy Spirit enabled him to be able to predict what was going to happen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul is dealing with the church in Corinth, and he's making the case here because the church in Corinth thought speaking in tongues was the best thing in the world. Everybody should speak in tongues. This is fun. This is great. I'm impressive because I can speak in tongues. And Paul is warning them, saying, no, this is not that big of a deal. You ought to pursue, first of all, chapter 13, love, <laughs> not bragging on yourself and the giftedness that you have. And second of all, Tongues aren't really as important as you think they are. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, he said, but they're not vital. And so we see there in verse, uh, starting in verse 1, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may what? Prophesy. Especially that you may prophesy. What does that mean? Well, a prophet would prophesy, right? That's the main prophet, prophesy. That makes sense, right? It is to speak forth the utterances of God. It's to speak forth. Now, let me ask you, in the church in Corinth, did they have the full New Testament? Say no, because it's being written, written to them right here, <laughs> right? This is part of the New Testament. The first letter written to them, they didn't, obviously didn't have 2 Corinthians yet, right? So they didn't even have the full New Testament. So guess what? The local church had prophets, prophets that could speak forth the word of God to people, to explain, and even a prophet may have taken this letter and explained it to the people and helped them understand and apply it rightly. Verse 2, For one who speaks in tongues speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. What does a prophet do? What is their purpose? It's to build up the church, it's to encourage the church, and it's to bring comfort to the church. It's to wrap their arms around the church with truth, right? Bringing truth to the church, speaking the truth of God, uttering what God would say about various situations, and that was the role of the prophets, and it appears to be within the local church primarily. They were doing their work within the local church, so do we have prophets today? You know, we already talked about Phil 
getting ahead of me, brother. No, that's great. I love it. <laughs> Bill knows. <laughs> no, we don't have the office of prophets today, and, 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 and I'll show you that in a moment. But understand that the office of prophecy, of, of, of a prophet, was very important in the local church without having this, right? I mean, somebody had to say, what, is, what does God want for the church while the scripture was being given through the apostles and through the prophets, written out so that they could have this? What, is, what do we use today? Right here, right? Turn your Bibles back to Ephesians. And look with me, first of all, in, verse, in chapter 3. And look at verses 4 and 5 with me. Here Paul references the apostles and prophets. He kind of puts them together a little bit. And he says this, When you read this, you can perceive my in insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. We see here the apostles and prophets were revealed this mystery. What's the mystery? Does anybody remember when we were going through here? What is the mystery of Christ that was not revealed in the Old Testament but is now revealed through Christ? The church, right? We are the mystery. You're part of the mystery. And, and that's been revealed through the apostles and the prophets. They, they brought the revelation forward. Do we know now? Is it a mystery any longer? No, I, I hope not. You know, I mean, we're here. <laughs> there's, no, there's no mystery to it now. It's, it's been revealed. So that work of revelation of the church and this mystery is completed, right? Go back to Ephesians chapter 2, and let's begin in verse 19. Paul writes, So then you, church, are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. We as a church are built on the foundation laid by the apostles and by the prophets. Now, go back to my illustration earlier, me building my house. Charlie Borgen was my mason, and when Charlie was done with the foundation and I started building on it, Charlie didn't lay more foundation. I mean, he had some concrete work to do, but he didn't lay more foundation. I built on the foundation that was laid. His work, as far as laying a foundation, was done. Is our foundation laid, the one laid by the apostles and the prophets? It's done. It's there. So guess what? There's no need today for apostles and prophets. Why? Because we have the foundation. Right? The foundation is right here. And we as builders on that foundation submit ourselves to the word of God. Amen? This is our rule for life and practice individually, but maybe even more importantly or as importantly in the church. Right? This is the foundation that God has generously, graciously given us. This is the work of the apostles and prophets. Does that make sense? And so therefore, I'm a, a cessationist. We are cessationists as Baptists, which means we believe God is done speaking out revelation to us. That doesn't mean God is not at work today. Is God at work today? <laughs> Absolutely. We see it all the time. But we have what we need, all that we need for life and godliness in his word. And we don't need men going around saying, I have a new revelation from the Lord. If somebody does that, either tell them to be quiet or just walk away. Okay, I, I saw an advertisement show up on my Facebook feed for Joel Osteen of all people. I don't know why they thought I might be interested in that. But, uh, and it said, he's going to give a word for, for me today if I want to tune in. He'll give a word for me today. And I thought... Yeah, well, it'll be his word because he certainly doesn't preach the word of God, right? And, and he would almost claim himself to be an apostle. I don't know if he's ever said that, but that's how he tries to come across as he gives Joel Osteen's word versus what the word of God says. And we need to hold to the foundation that has been given to us, don't we? And hold tightly to that foundation. Imagine if I were to build my house 
And I said, you know, I want to make it just a little bigger. So I'm going to build on this sand over here. By the way, where I come from, it's sand. And the Bible talks about shifting sand, right? I mean, if you know anything about sand, it shifts. Yeah. <laughs> and if I had built some of my house, I'm going to build this part over here on sand. That part would have sunk in and fallen over and it would drag the rest of the house with it, wouldn't it? I mean, you, you have to build on the foundation. We don't go build on our own ideas, our own thoughts. We need to be careful as we work in the church that we stay on the foundation God has given us. I, I know I'm picky about this, you know, and sometimes people think I might be hypercritical. And I understand that, and I can be. I know that tendency in my life, but I tell you, I'd rather, rather stick closer to Scripture than error. I really would. Um, I think it's so important to stay on the foundation. I believe God is teaching us that. So these apostles, these prophets, they're the layers of the foundation, and then we see there's the evangelists. Now, who are these? Who are the evangelists? Um, there's only one person described as an evangelist in Scripture. His name is Philip. And Philip is described as an evangelist. Philip was not, not the apostle Philip. That's a different Philip. This Philip was chosen to be a deacon, one of the seven chosen to be a deacon in the church to help so that the apostles could devote themselves to the study of the word and prayer. And so he was chosen to do that work. But as the persecution began to rise up, the Jewish persecution against the church, Philip was dispersed and he ended up in Samaria. And guess what he did there? He proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and he's dispersed further into the area of Caesarea, and he proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he meets up with the Ethiopian, and he proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does an evangelist do? Proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and some, in some fashion, there's a gift to the church of evangelists. I believe today you might call them church planters, right? Right? They're gifts to the church to plant churches in places where there's a need for churches, in places where there's no gospel preaching ministry. They might go in and missionaries could be considered evangelists, those that go out and seek to raise up people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They could exist within the local church, right? People who just have this passion. It just always leaks out of them. The, the idea is a gospeler. There's someone who the gospel just always flows out of and they exist today there's no reason for us to believe that they're gone that God is continuing to give us evangelists today now I mean imagine and when I say evangelist you probably imagine right away like Billy Graham or something like that and I'm not saying he he may have been one of the gifted evangelists right I mean, there were evangelists given to the church, and there are still today, and they build on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And if you think about what an evangelist does, they go out and preach the gospel. Now, think about the ministry of an apostle for a moment. As they're laying the foundation, what do they do? They go out and preach the gospel, right? But they do signs and wonders and miracles to confirm the message, and, and they also gave a scripture now, is the evangelist giving a scripture? No. I just said, the canon is closed, right? The evangelist is building on the scripture that he's been given as he preaches the gospel. And he's building on the foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. We don't need apostles, but we need evangelists, don't we? We need people who are ready and willing to be always sharing the gospel. And some people, you've seen it, they're just gifted with it. Like they can take a conversation and they can just flip it right away and talk about the gospel. And you're like, how do they do that? You ever, you ever seen that? Like someone who can just, they're just always, always, always able. And, and to some degree, we all need to be evangelists, right? Timothy, the only other place this word evangelist is used in scripture is to Timothy when he's told, do the work of an evangelist. Now, I don't know if Timothy had the gift of evangelism, but he was told, as I said earlier, that if he didn't hold the office, he was still to do the work. We are all to be evangelists to some degree. There are just some specifically gifted by God, the Holy Spirit, right, that just, he just seems to work through them in a special way. And we've probably all seen and heard of those people in our lives. I think God is still giving them to the church. He's still giving them to the church. And in the last office we see he gives the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, 
and the shepherds and teachers. Now, the Greek construction here is shepherds, teachers, shepherd teachers. So it's, it's one office. Now, who do you think that might be? If you're looking at them, okay? <laughs> at Norton Baptist Church, anyway. You're stuck with me as your shepherd teacher. I am the pastor here. When you, when you see that word shepherd or pastor, when you see the word elder in the Bible, or maybe your version says bishop at different places or overseer, that's all the same office. And, and throughout Peter and throughout the book of Acts, we can see that that is the same activity, the same individual that shepherds the church, that is pastor of the church. So when you see pastors, elders, overseers, bishops in your Bible, just know that's talking about that one office, pastor. What does a shepherd teacher do? Well, they're a shepherd. They give care for the souls of the congregation. They give care to the souls of the church. Now, let's understand what that means. Care for the souls of the church. You know, some people sometimes call me up like, like they got they got something wrong with them physically, and I'm like that that's I'm not a doctor, <laughs> right? Call a doctor when you have a physical ailment. <laughs> Don't call me. <laughs> I mean, if you now if it's affecting you spiritually, or you're like I'm not sure how to sort through why is God allowing me to be sick, and I get those calls. Why I, I had one this weekend? Why why am I going through this at this moment? And, and while I don't have all the answers, I can lead them in the truth of God's word, can't I? Like a prophet, I can give them consolation. I can give them comfort. I can give them truth, can't I? As a shepherd, I ought to do that. Can I just say as a shepherd, as your shepherd here at Norton Baptist Church, when I think of shepherd, I try to think of the flock and the sheep and, and how it functions can, can I just tell you this morning that, that when you think of a flock, if a sheep is hurting, do they just stay quiet about it? No, what do they do? Bah, bah, right? I mean, they make noise. They let, they let people know, I need help here, don't they? Can I just say as your shepherd, because I hear this often, like, my pastor doesn't care for me at all. Not, I don't hear it here, but I hear that from people in churches. And my first question is, does he know? D does he know? Is he aware? I mean, have you... Le well, he should know. Maybe. Maybe he should, but have you at least made him aware that you could use some help? Can I just say that, that, that don't... If you have not made me aware of where you need care, then, then please don't say that I don't care. Now, if you've made me aware, you've made it clear, I'd like some help here, and I've said, I'm busy. Now you've got a gripe with me, okay? And the whole church should have a gripe with me, right? <laughs> Everybody should have a gripe with me saying, wait a minute, that's your role. You know, and they should call me to account in that. But I just, I just want to encourage you as a church family, I care. I do care. And, and, and maybe I'm thick-headed at times. That can be the case where you've tried to hint at it and you've tried to hint that you could use some care and I went, I didn't catch the hint. Don't hint. Bleat out like a lamb and let me know. Like, be blunt with me. You know, you can be blunt with me. I don't mind at all. Look, pastor, I need you to call me. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> And by the way, I love to. I really do. But you can ask my wife. There's times where some, she's trying to hint at me, and I'm pretty thick-headed. I don't catch the hint. All right? If you're trying to hint at me, and I don't catch the hint, it may be because I'm just thick-headed. So be a little more blunt with me, okay? <laughs> Let me be of help. Because that is my role as a shepherd, is to care for the souls of the sheep. And I want to. And, I, and so I invite you to allow me to do that as much as you're willing. All right? So, so you may not be there today, but just know when the time comes where you're like, I am hurting so badly, and I, I just I don't know how to think about this situation, please call me up, call the office, and say, I need pastor to give me a call. Call my cell phone, text me. You know, let me know. So I can come alongside of you and, and bring you the comfort and encouragement, the teaching that you may need in that moment. 
I just want to be so clear on this, that, that that's what I'm here for. And I desire it. I desire to be alongside of you. Shepherds care. Shepherds also feed. That's what I'm trying to do this morning as I preach and every Sunday morning. I'm feeding the flock. You come and hopefully you have something to eat this morning from God's word. Some truth that hits you. And so I, I continue to try to feed the flock. Why do I spend almost half my week, maybe more some weeks, on this 45 minutes of time to try to get this message clear? Why do I do that? Because it's the one time that I can speak to the entire flock at one time. You know, if you need personal care, you come to my office. I will try my best to feed you the Word of God, to care for you in that moment. But that's one-on-one, -on -one and I'm only impacting one person. But, but when we come in together on Sunday morning, I'm impacting 80 or 100 people. A and I'm thankful to be able to do that. And sometimes, some of you can testify to this. And this is not, just remember, we'll get to this a little later, but this is not about me. But sometimes as I have preached the word, some of you have gone, I needed that today. I needed to hear that this week. And but that's the Holy Spirit, Okay. But sometimes you may have been even thinking, I need to make an appointment, and then you heard the scripture preached, and you went, I don't need that appointment anymore. I know what I need. Because I fed at that moment, right? And because the Holy Spirit took the food and helped you digest it and understand it and then live it out. So I, I feed the flock, and that's why so much of my time is spent on this particular moment in our service. I also am to protect the flock. You know, some people probably cringe when I mention Joel Osteen. Why do you have to say things about him? Because you need to know that he's a heretic. I need to guard the flock. A and you need to be warned that that man will devour you if given the chance. Uh, men like Stephen Furtick, they'll devour you if they get the chance. These, these men are heretics, and I want to protect you. Now, you can still choose to listen to him. I won't stop you. I won't walk into your homes and check what you're listening to. That's your business. But at least I give you the warning. You know, if a, if a sheep is walking along the fence and there's a wolf on the other side of the fence, would the shepherd not go and try to grab that sheep as best he could and lead him away? You know, and fight off the wolf? You know, sometimes the one who fights the wolf is the one who gets blamed for the problem. I, I've seen that in church. Someone comes in, creeps in, and starts teaching falsehood, and someone corrects them, and the one who corrects, you, you're too harsh. This person's teaching falsehood. I've seen this happen in a church, where someone brought correction to someone who was teaching wrongly, and the one who brought the correction was considered rude and obnoxious. And I'm like, no! <laughs> no, the one who's teaching untruth is dangerous. If they're speaking with authority... And speaking with a place of authority, we've we got to stop that. That's guarding the entire flock. And you all are more important than one of you who thinks that they should teach when they teach falsely. All of you are more important. I like what Bob Combs had told me a long time ago. Pastor, he used to be pastor at Grace Norton up the road here. And he had said, deal with the worst or you're going to lose the best. In other words, with those who cause division, with those who, who teach falsely, deal with them. Because those who are godly and biblical will end up walking away and saying, I'm going someplace else. I'm going to where somebody will protect me. I'm going to where I'll be guarded. And so let's remember, when truth is involved, there's a place for that protection, for some sternness at times. And we, not, we, we need to be careful that when we see that, we understand, wait a minute, truth is involved. That's a place to be firm, right? That's a place to be accurate and careful, especially when someone's trying to teach with authority. Does that make sense? So the shepherd guards the flock, and then the shepherd's a teacher. He instructs, right? Shepherd, teacher. There's instruction that is given consistently in all kinds of situations, whether it be personal or whether it be from the pulpit. My goal this morning is to teach you about apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. But more than that, it's to teach you about the first few words of this verse. And he gave. And he gave. God gave the apostles and prophets who lay the foundation. 
And God gave or and continues to give the evangelists and the shepherd teachers to help build on that foundation. And then he goes on in verse 12, a little spoiler alert for next week, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ and continuing on in that phrase. But I want us to stop for a moment and realize that God gives these. That God gives. Why does that matter? Why does it matter that it's God that gives? It's Christ through the Spirit who gives. I believe this is so important. I think this is key to what Paul is saying. Because we go back to verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is a grace of God to the church. And it's evidence, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of God, the gifts of Jesus Christ... To the church are apostles and prophets, which now we have their evidence in their work here in the scriptures, amen? And then the evangelists and the pastors who continue to build on that. And these are gifts from God to the church. And you say, that sounds very self-serving, pastor, because you're saying you're a gift to us. I am saying I'm a gift to you. But let's understand what that means. I'm not bragging on myself. Why? Why? Well, because the gift is not greater than the giver. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're two weeks out from Christmas, right? I mean, you're not going to get a gift, and it's the perfect gift. It's the right gift, and go, you're a wonderful gift, and, and I love you so much. Thank you, gift. That's silly, right? No, you're going to think of the one who bought the perfect gift, the giver, and you're going to go, I can't believe you thought of this. That's part, oh, you must have really been thinking, and I appreciate this so much. I appreciate you, wouldn't you? Thank you. The gift is not greater than the giver. If the gift is great, it's because you have a great giver. Now, you'll have to decide if I'm a great gift or not, but the measure of the gift is from the giver. And I don't mean to say that I'm a great gift, but I do believe that I am a gift to the church. But I believe you're a gift to me too, by the way, and each one of you are a gift to the church. Every one of you are, and we'll work through that more as we work through verse 12 and 13, but all of you are a gift to the church. I thank God for you. What a great giver he is that he has put all of you and each of you here at Norton Baptist Church. I'm so thankful for you. I love each and every one of you. I am a thankful man for the gifts that God has given Norton Baptist Church. Each of you are a gift because our God is a great giver. Because our God is a great giver, isn't he? A gracious God. See, the giver chooses the gift, right? The giver is the one who chooses the gift. The gift doesn't sit on the shelf and say, pick me, pick me, pick me. I mean, with some type of advertisement, it feels like it may be. You know, it's almost jumped off the shelves into my arm. But, but the gift doesn't do that. The giver goes and he seeks out the gift, and he chooses the gift. God chooses the gift. Let me tell you, when it comes to the offices in the church, I didn't choose to be a pastor God chose me anytime it's only of man's choice be wary it's got to be God's choice now how do I know I've been chosen right well first Timothy 3 says if someone has a desire to be an elder to be a bishop to be an overseer to be a pastor they desire a good thing but the desire alone is not enough because there's qualifications laid out Okay, do I meet those qualifications, right? Do I, do I fit with the qualifications that God desires in a pastor? If I don't, then at this point, I'm not supposed to be one, right? And, I, and I've got to say not yet, or, or at least not now. Maybe no forever, I don't know. But we, we need to examine ourselves. Somebody here may think, maybe I'm supposed to be in ministry. Maybe that's where I'm supposed to be. And we'll talk just a moment and a little bit about that and, and how you can help discover that. But let me give you this. The giver not only chooses the gift, but in this case, the giver enables the gift. The giver gifts the giver, the gift. The giver gifts the gift with the gifts that the gift, gift has. 
In other words, the abilities that I have as a pastor are not my abilities. They are God's abilities through the Holy Spirit given to me. They absolutely are. Ask my mom. She raised me. She knows what I'm gifted with. <laughs> and she would say, I'm sure she would say when he was young, he likes to talk, so maybe he'll be a long-winded pastor, but uh, there's a lot of other things he's got to work on if he ever wanted to be a pastor. But, you know, I didn't work on him. You know who worked on him? Holy Spirit did. And he enabled me with a giftedness to be a pastor. And the same would be true of evangelists and missionaries, right? They, the, the Spirit enables them. And therefore, the giver deserves all the glory for the gift, doesn't he? The giver deserves all the glory for the gift. So if, I, if you ever think, well, pastor must think a lot of himself because he calls himself a gift of the church. You know, Sean, the name Sean actually means God's gracious gift. I reminded my family of that often when I was a kid. That's why my mom wondered whether I would ever be a pastor, you know. <laughs> I'm God's gift. But the reality is, is that's just true. But it's because of a great giver. That's why. Not because of a great gift, a great giver who enables the gift to be anything that the gift is. I also would say that the giver supplies all our need. You know, Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God supplies our need according to his riches. Is he lacking his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Is there any lacking in the riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Nope, nothing lacking. So God supplies all the needs of the church, doesn't he? You know, there might have been a time between Pastor Strickland and myself where maybe some in Norton Baptist Church said, we have a need and God's not supplying. No, God was supplying. God was supplying. And he did, didn't he, Pastor Mike here? He supplied in various areas, probably, a very, I believe, a very needful thing, his ministry here for about a year with all of you. What an awesome gift he is, right? Praise God for that. God supplies the need. The giver is not lacking. The giver isn't lacking in resources, and he's not lacking in grace, is he? He loves to give. So church, I want us to understand out of that that the giver, our gracious giver, who supplies our every need, supplies every leader that we need in the church. Not just pastors, but every gift that we need. Every gift that we need here at Norton Baptist Church. It's so easy, if you're in ministry especially, and you're leading a ministry, maybe even especially more, like, I need more of, I need more of, I need people, I need, I need these people, I, I need, I need, I need, and forget Philippians 4.19. My God supplies every need. I have what I need. I have what I need. As a pastor, I could think through and say, boy, we really could need, no, we don't need. God has supplied all of our need, and I need to be content with that. He is a gracious giver. He has not withheld anything that we need because he has all the resources, and he is gracious God that loves to give. So therefore, nothing's withheld. There's no problem here. Also, we need to understand that it's God through his Holy Spirit that raises up evangelists or missionaries or church planners, pastors, it's God who raises them up. And I think that's so important to the church because we think it's Bible colleges that raise them up. We think it's seminaries that raise them up. Can I say that we even think it's churches that raise them up? It's churches that give these to the church. No, it's God. It's God, the Holy Spirit, who enables the gifted to be a gift. It's Him. It's Him. I tell you, I got a, a list of surveys. I never threw it out, sitting in my drawer, and I looked at it this week, that many of you filled out while you were without a pastor, speaking to the pulpit committee, saying, as they ask questions, can I just say, I'm so thankful as I read through many of those, that you answered a lot of times, that doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. You know, how old should he be? Doesn't matter. You know, should he have kids? And doesn't matter. You know, should he have a seminary degree? Doesn't matter. You know, all the doesn't matters. And I'm like, you know why you said it doesn't matter, I hope, was because you have been taught for years that if it matters, it'd be in here. 
And since it's not in here, whether the seminary, the Bible degree, all of those things, you said, it doesn't matter. Scripture doesn't speak to it. So that doesn't matter. As you, as you, as a, a public committee sought advice from the church, you gave them wise advice by giving them feedback saying, these are the things that matter. Can he preach? That matters. We need to be fed. And, and that came out clear. Is he a praying man? You know, that matters to us. Because he needs to be a person that prays, right? You, you, had, you had the things that mattered. Is he qualified, biblically, to be a pastor? Those are the ideas that this church family said, this is what matters. And can I just tell you that the church right now, I hear it all the time, leaders, um, representatives of our association, they'll say, we need more pastors, and next time somebody says that, I'm going to quote in Philippians 4.19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches and Christ, glory in Christ Jesus. We have enough pastors. Because he supplied them. We have enough. You say, but there's churches without pastors. Understood, but we have enough. So the problem isn't on God's end. The problem must be someplace here, right? In us, in men. It's not God's lack of resources. It's something we're not doing right. And maybe what we ought to do is examine what we are doing rather than say, God, we just don't have enough. And you know, what did Jesus say when, when he said the fields are white with harvest? Did he say, so raise up men to go out into the field? No, what did he say? He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers out into his harvest. You know, maybe we need to just be asking God, where are these men? Because I know you've supplied them. I know they're there. Where are they? You know, the role of the church is not to gift these men. The role of the church is to equip, but they don't bring the giftedness. That's the Holy Spirit. The role of the church mainly is to recognize the gift. It's to see it in people that serve and go, I wonder. I wonder. They, 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 the way they serve and, and what they do, and, and I just wonder if, that person isn't called into the ministry. They seem gifted. And the church should do that together. We don't raise them up. We just recognize them. And I think because we have made seminary and Bible college the standard, the baseline, and I'm not opposed to seminary and Bible college. I went to Bible college, but since we have made that the baseline, we have ignored many who have said, I can't afford that. I can't go there. And so we've overlooked those men, and God says, I've gifted you, but you just won't have them because you've set up man's standards instead of my standards. And the church has to get better at this, don't they? I mean, we have to first recognize, no, God has supplied. If we have faith in God, then he has. So let's recognize it. Who among us could God be raising up to hold an office in the church? Are we ready to recognize it? Are we watching? And for those of you who may say, I wonder if God would want to move, me, move in me that way, or maybe you've got that desire, how, how do you discover it? Let me just share with you that how I discovered it. I, I basically just started serving. <laughs> Opportunities in the church came my way. You know, people, can, we need someone to do this. No one volunteered because very rarely will someone volunteer, right? So what did I do? I can do that. And so I served. You know, another hole opened up, and, and maybe this one closed, or maybe I had time to, I'll go over here, you know. We need a nursery worker. Well, that's not pastoral ministry. Yeah, but I, you need a nursery worker? I can work in the nursery. I can serve there. You know, if you want to know what God wants to use you for, and we'll talk about this a lot more probably next week, but if you want to know what God wants to use you for in the church, start serving. Just find a place to serve. And as you serve, he's going to move you in the direction that he wants to move you in and show your giftedness in the church. Because this is what started happening in the church I went to, is people started watching me serve and saying, you know, you, you do this, and you, I wonder if you could be gifted for ministry. And, and the church began to recognize it. And praise God that they did that the church started to recognize there's a giftedness here. 
And I started to think through it, and do I have the desire? I kind of had the desire for a while, but I just wasn't going to open my mouth because I was scared to. <laughs> but do you see how God works in spiritual giftedness? Let me tell you, this is not specific just to pastors. Each of you has been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Each of you have been. Where does God want you to serve? I don't know. But I know this. It's in the church. I don't know what specific area. But as you get opportunity to serve, get serving. And don't worry about what is the gift of what, what, what is my spiritual gift? Who cares? Serve. And you know what? I guarantee you over time the Spirit's going to reveal where your giftedness is and move you in the right direction because that's what he does. And we'll talk more about that next week. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful again to be here this morning. We thank you for the fact that we can be so confident that you have provided all that we need. So, Father, even this morning as a church family, everyone here is for a purpose. We all are here by your hand. And we are thankful that you provided the one another May we be an encouragement to another. May, be, may we find ways, even today, to serve one another. Maybe be a word of encouragement or exhortation or uh, a hug or a handshake. Or, Father, just, just let us know what you want us to do with one another this morning to serve and to give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.